Yes, so welcome. I see that Larry did a better job of filling this room than I am. Um, then again, maybe people are still pouring in over lunch, um, which is fine. Uh, anyway, so I'll get started. Um, so this is Serialization with Symphony, um, and my name is Lucas Smith. Um, I'm a developer at Leap uh, in Switzerland. Uh, I did a few things in the PHP world. Um, one of the things was actually that I started the serializer component with Jordi. Um, it's actually kind of funny because uh, when I you know, started on this talk or proposing this talk, I didn't quite remember if I actually did start it or not. Um, so I had to look at the commit history. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was in the very early days of Symphony that we started feeling that we needed something like a serializer, and I think it started, it, it, I think it started initially outside of Symphony and then was brought into Symphony a little bit later on. Um, yeah, and you can find me on Twitter on, with, my, uh, with L. Smith. Now, I have a, a slight confession to make. So um, some of you might know this guy, and uh, maybe as a quick show of hands, who here was at DrupalCon LA? Okay, one person. Two persons, okay. Um, I'm not sure, did anybody attend this talk by, by so a serializer talk in, in LA? So no, okay, that's great. Because I actually ended up stealing Hugo's slides for the most part and just updating them. Um, mostly because uh, I have a, yeah, two weeks ago I got married, so I, got, I ended up being a little bit more busy than expected. And also this day is kind of crazy for me because I'm actually doing three talks. Um, and then I decided actually in the end that in the open source spirit, it kind of makes more sense that I improve upon what has already been created rather than creating the same slides again, just with a different layout. Um, so these slides are updated from the version from LA. There are two things that have happened in the serializer component since then, a few typos that I fixed. And obviously I'm going to put a slightly different uh, slant on a few of these slides obviously. So um, uh, yeah, so without further ado, let's get going. Um, yeah, so the, today's topic is the serializer component, and uh, maybe first we need to figure out what serialization is. And essentially, it's taking um, you know a data structure, uh, usually in memory, and then um, you know some object state or whatever, and then um, you know bringing it to a different format that allows you to store and reconstruct this data, uh, usually in a you know string uh, format. And there are different ways of, you know, or different formats that you can, you know, convert into or out of. Um, so, for example, HTTP messages, these are in the end just plain text messages. So you can, you know, in, in theory also just take, you know, an object and then serialize that to an HTTP message and back. Um, in a way, Symfony uh, kind of does that. You know, we have a request and we have a response object and they get kind of transferred to string representations. They don't use the serializer component, though. Um, more classical ways of doing serialization would be going to XML or back, uh, SOAP messages, uh, JSON, YAML, CSV, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I think in theory, I, don't, I doubt that anybody has done it, but I guess you could also use the serializer component to generate PDFs and images. Um, but uh, that would sort of be um, kind of hard to deserialize again, but you could even do like text recognition then. I don't know. Anyway. So the most common use cases of using serialization is, you know, you want to store some object state into a file or a database. Um, uh, REST APIs are, is probably even more the prime use case, and this is how uh, Drupal 8 uses the serializer component mostly, uh, you know, generating SOAP. In theory, you could also use this to sort of distributed object instances, so Java does that, um, where, you know, you can serialize an object to a string and then instantiate it back at a, on a different server and continue processing there. So before we dive into the Symfony uh, serializer component, let's look at some of the ways how we can actually do serialization just with out-of-the-box features from PHP. Um, so uh, there's, you know, the obvious choice uh, is the serialize method. Um, so you basically throw in almost everything into the serialize method and uh, you will then get back some string representation like this. It's a little bit cryptic, but somewhat readable. Um, and then you can, of course, unserialize that data um, and get back you know, uh, from that string representation to an actual variable with the different uh, types and so on. So as you can see here, you can, you can have like nulls and Boolean values, strings, arrays, and even objects uh, as well. Now, there is something um, that is a little bit tricky 
um, with serialization is, and actually let me go back here. So as you can see here, I don't have anything uh, or example of serializing a resource, and that's because it's not possible with the PHP um, serialized method. So basically, if you try to re serialize something that contains a resource, being a, you know, the resource itself or an array with resources or an object with resources, you will get an error. And um, with objects, however, you can work around this problem. Um, and there are these two magic uh, methods that you can uh, implement in your class, underscore um, sleep and uh, wake up. Um, and with these methods, you can uh, solve the problem of you know, uh, dealing with resources. So let me give you a quick example here. So this would be some database connection class. Uh, you want to you know, encapsulate P PDO, for example, for some reason. Um, and, you know, in the constructor you might pass in uh, a DSN, a username, and a password. And then you have this connect method um, that you call at some point, which actually creates a PDO instance and assigns it uh, to a property. And actually underneath PDO there is a resource, and it, um, you will run into problems um, if you just serialize that. It's not going to come out uh, properly connected to your database. So the way to solve that is to implement these sleep and wake up methods. So in the sleep method, you basically specify which properties you want to include in the serialized, serialized format. Um, so in this case, we're, we're specifying the DSN user and password properties. And, and if you're not familiar with this um, curly bracket syntax, this is a short array syntax that was introduced in PHP 5.4. So this is essentially like when the return DSN user password, this is just the same as saying return array parentheses and then um, these strings. Um, so that takes care about the, the, the case when we call serialize. And then with wake up, this method is called when you call unserialized on uh, a string containing a reference to this class uh, connection. So what we do on the wake up, we just basically call this connect method again that we saw in the previous slide. So it'll you know, take those, uh, the, you know, the values from the properties that have already been set then from the unserialized method and then create the PDO instance again. So we can, uh, thanks to these two methods here, we can safely serialize the connection class and unserialize it again and, um, and immediately have it uh, connected. Um, so essentially you could do something like this, you know, make an instance of that connection class, run a query, serialize um, the instance, unserialize it again, and then run another query. Now, um, there's also a new interface that was added. Well, I'm trying to remember. I think it was PHP 5.4, um, serializable interface. Um, so this gives you another option. So instead of using these underscore underscore methods, you can also uh, implement the serializable interface. And then you have this method serialize that you can overwrite. And here you basically return an array, uh, which can be you know, a quite liberal data structure. Um, of things that you want to serialize. So you get more control um, in many ways. Uh, so you can even do some data massaging, like re uh, you know, uh, removing some additional data that you don't think belongs into the serialized, uh, serialized format. Um, and then in the unserialized method, you basically get that data back, serialized, and you can unserialize it again and then do uh, additional things uh, that you feel are important to do during the unserialization process. Um, you know, these magic underscore underscore methods are sort of like an old style, uh, I would say. Um, so this approach to me is definitely more object oriented. Um, and so therefore I would recommend it um, if you have a recent enough PHP version. Now, this format, of course, this is a, a PHP custom format. Um, it has been, you know, fairly stable over many years. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a PHP-specific format, and oftentimes you might want to exchange data with other systems when you do serialization. So for that, PHP also provides some ways to deal with JSON, for example, which is becoming more and more of a popular way to deal with serialization and data exchange between different systems. Now, there's two, method, uh, two functions, sorry, uh, JSON encode and decode. They're basically the equivalent of uh, serialize and unserialize. And then there's also a uh, uh, fairly new addition, also uh, the JSON serializable um, uh, interface. So the JSON serializable interface, it kind of boils down to something very similar to what we saw with the uh, serializable um, interface. Um, 
and you know you just get this JSON serialized method um, that you need to implement, and then this will be used uh, during uh, encoding. Okay, so that was very fast, uh, just going through the basics of how you can do serialization with PHP out of the box without installing any additional components and so on and so forth. However, um, oftentimes when you deal with serialization, you will end up in situations that are much more complex to deal with than what is possible out of the box. Um, and this is where the Symfony Serializer can help um, quite a bit, actually. Um, and uh, I said that I, I started the Serializer, but when I originally started it, it was much more simple. Um, and uh, it has grown quite a bit uh, thanks to uh, several other developers uh, that have contributed to the component. And I actually haven't done anything to the component except for one, I think, little thing for the Composer JSON file a few days ago. Um, so many of the things that you're going to see here are not to my credit or Jordy's, but actually um, other people in the Symphony community. So uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do with the Serializer component was to really enable people to deal with all sorts of formats. Um, so XML and JSON were the two that we focused on the beginning, but from the, very architect from the very beginning, we architected things to enable people to be able to support other formats if they wish, um, even very custom formats or high-level formats, like you could have uh, serialized to your personal style of JSON, where you have a specific structure in JSON that you want, and that would be very easy to achieve that. Um, and essentially, the, the, the architecture that we came up with was, th was this. So um, if you start off from, from the object uh, in the, at the top and you want to uh, serialize that, what we have is a process called normalization, which basically brings you to sort of an array representation. And then the error representation is passed on to what we call an encoder, which then actually does the actual serialization. Um, and then, the, you know, going back, it's the same, essentially the same process in reverse. You first decode into an array, and then you uh, denormalize that into an object instance. Um, the, there are methods that actually allow you to sort of start in the middle and then directly jump to an object or uh, directly go to a format. But the normal process is that you actually call uh, these serialized and deserialized methods, which basically do all of the, these two steps for you in one go, um, so you don't have to call these separate methods. So uh, basically what you will be working with is an instance of the serializer. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, most of the time you'll just use the serialized and deserialized methods. Um, the serialized method basically gets some data, it can be whatever, um, the format that you want to serialize into, um, and then a context, and we'll see later how that context uh, can be very useful uh, to sort of customize what should happen when a code happens. And then deserialize is very similar. Um, you have a data a type. This is useful um, if you, you know, to specify sort of what object you want to uh, deserialize into, um, uh, because you don't necessarily embed that into your um, serialized result. Um, the format again, and then another, uh, the context again. But uh, if you wish to, you can, of course, uh, sort of skip uh, some of the steps, directly do, just do a normalize or denormalize, uh, encode and decode. And then with supports normalization and denormalization, you can sort of validate uh, ahead of time if this will actually work or not. Um, and the same, th same thing for encoding. There's the supports encoding and decoding methods. So let's briefly see how that works. Uh, I assume that everybody is sort of familiar with uh, namespace syntax. Um, in PHP 5.3, so you start off, you know, with a few use statements, um, just to be able to use shorter uh, class names in your code then. Um, you instantiate an array of so-called normalizers, then an array of so-called encoders, and you pass those in as the first and second parameter to the serializer. Um, and then, and that's, that's really key, um, that basically depending on what sort of you pass in there depends on how the serializer is going to work. Um, so if you, for example, skip adding that XML encoder, then you will not be able to um, serialize into XML. Um, and if you add additional normalizers, then they can have different priority, uh, different behaviors, and, and di produce different results for you. But it, essentially, it's, it's fairly easy to use then. Um, so once that serializer instance has been set up, um, then you can just call it serialize, pass in your data, the format that you want, and you just you know, get your serialized format back. And then you can deserialize this quite easily. Here we can see, uh, in this case, when we call deserialize, we're saying, okay, that data there is actually an instance of an ACME user um, 
object, so please uh, use that class when you, you know, denormalize that data. And then in this case, uh, we're saying this is actually, uh, you know, was serialized to JSON, so unserialize that. Um, Right, so here's a quick overview of the normalizers and denormalizers. Um, there's a small addition that happened since that talk in, in, in LA. The array denormalizer was added. I think it's in 2.8, so I think it's not yet in a stable release. Um, in, most, in many cases, you get away with just using that simple uh, property normalizers. The, the get set method normalizers and the object normalizers are actually quite similar. Uh, the object uh, normalizer is a little bit more fancy. Um, can deal with, um, uh, yeah, it uses the property access component from Symfony to figure out um, if there is a method uh, defined to, um, uh, to get the, the, the data from the object or if it should use a property. Um, and the get set method normalizer uh, just has a little bit simpler logic in trying to figure out if there are methods to call rather than just directly taking the property values. Um, the array denormalizer is just um, a very handy thing if you have an array of um, objects uh, normalized. Um, and uh, we'll later see actually the full implement or most of the implementation of it um, so we can dive into detail how it works. Then encoders that are available out of the box is the JSON encoder and XML encoder. Um, so that's, this is it, what you have out of the box. Um, then there's also the chain encoder and chain decoder because you might want to chain these. So for example, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, you might have some high-level uh, syntax uh, based on JSON that you want to uh, uh, work into. Then you can have, uh, I don't know, your, your HAL encoder, um, which uh, extends the JSON encoder, uh, something like that. Uh, could be possible, but uh, inheritance is always kind of a tricky thing. Um, so with a chain encoder, you basically don't need to inherit. Um, you can basically just say, okay, here's the first encoder, then the second encoder that you should use in this, these in these cases. So a basic usage. Um, so let's look at you know a very simple example. We have a movie class, a bunch of private properties. Um, they can of course also be protected, um, and um, you know you make an instance of that uh, object. Um, you know assigning uh, different values to these properties through setters. Um, of course, it doesn't need to be setters. Um, but um, and then you can serialize and, and unserialize that. So that's pretty straightforward. We really haven't um, done much more, really, than uh, what we would get with the core features here. A um, little word on the, the, the property serialization. So basically, in this case, we're uh, we're just using that very simple property uh, normalizer. Um, and so what we end up with is a JSON representation that really maps one-to-one -to, -one to the property names we had in our class. And same case for the XML serialization. So that's basically, depending on if you encode it to JSON or XML, these were the two representations that you would get. Deserialization is then also fairly easy. Uh, again, um, that's pretty much straightforward what you essentially get with the core um, JSON encode and decode in this case. Then here, the XML example, um, you know, we just get our representation back. And this is essentially that print R statement on the previous slide. This is what it would uh, basically provide us with. Um, so exactly what we would want. There's already one really cool th feature um, in there, is that for the de denormalization or deserialization, sorry, one thing that it does, it actually introspects the constructor. And if it finds that the property names on your class match um, at least some of the, or all of the constructor parameters, um, then it will actually call the constructor rather than directly setting out properties. So if you follow that rule um, of naming your constructor parameters the same way as you name your properties on your, on your uh, class, you basically get an automatic call to your constructor, which could be useful to do certain things during setup, like um, setting up some resource or things like that. Um, so that's just uh, very handy. All right, so really this is, this is more basics. Again, we haven't really gained much compared to the core features. So now next thing is um, actually seeing uh, what, what more we can do. All right. So getter has or is there a method normalizers. So this is basically... I'm not sure if you're all familiar with this term. So if you have like a, a get something, uh, set something, uh, has something, or is something method, 
Um, these are called like getter, hazard, iser, and so on and so forth. Um, so basically, you can leverage these if you use either the object normalizer or the get set method normalizers. Um, and uh, so in this code example here, uh, we basically added those two first lines up there, basically adding those additional normalizers. And what's important here to take away is that the order matters. Um, so the normalizers are called in the order that they're put into this array. And remember, there was this supports normalization method uh, on the serializer. Actually, the normalizers have this method as well. Um, and so when the serializer goes through to determine if it, uh, which normalizer to take, it looks at the first one in the array, sees if that one, if the supports uh, normalization method says true, then it will actually call that normalizer. So the or er order is very important to consider. Um, so in this case, uh, we have the object normalizer first and then the get set method normalizer second and then the property normalizer third, um, which I think will probably boil down to, it will probably most always use the object normalizer, um, but I'm not entirely sure because the object normalizer will probably gobble up everything with this support call. Anyway, um, what is nice about this is that if, let's say we have extended our movie class to add some more methods, like we have this get ID, get title, and then it has genre and is released method, that uh, the object normalizer will actually pick up these has genre and is released methods and actually add that to the serialized data. Um, it will also go through the get ID and the get title methods rather than directly accessing, accessing the properties. Um, so in this case, once you know, we've added this, basically we would get a serialization uh, result where we have these added um, um, fields here like genre and released. And as you might notice here, it's not uh, has genre or is released. Um, um, so this is sort of um, some special feature there in the um, object normalizer. And then um, this XML serialization representation would look similar to that. Now, next is uh, sometimes you don't want to uh, serialize everything that you have in your object. Um, like, for example, you might have a user object. You might not want to serialize the password hash or whatever. Um, so you can do that uh, by uh, calling the set ignored attributes method on the normalizer. Um, so basically, if we say um, set ignore uh, attributes and we say ignore stored key, then basically means that that normalizer will ignore any property uh, or you know get storage key or whatever method um, uh, when it's, it does the serialization. Um, so here we basically just have the same representation as before, just with that one line uh, omitted. Um, so now we, you know, you're, you're starting to see that there are some things that are you know, more advanced uh, compared to the, the core uh, serialization capabilities. Now, another thing that you might uh, be concerned about is actually the naming inside your serialized format. So um, for example, what you can do is you could use the camel case to snake case name converter um, and pass that in as a second parameter into your normalizer. Um, and then that will change uh, the way that the, the, um, the serialization then uh, uh, happens to that you have, in this case, where we had release date that was previously camel case, this is now a snake case. Um, so that, that's also quite convenient. And in fact, you can even customize that. So you can create your own name converter. So in this example, we want to create a name converter that actually prefixes um, the... Um, the, the serialization of each of these properties with the name of the class, um, or sorry, no, with a, with a prefix, I'm sorry. Um, so just with a prefix. So this is, you know, you can create this on your own. Um, just implement that name converter interface, which has been introduced in Symfony 2.7, um, and uh, you would get this result. So you call uh, name, uh, or you, you make an instance of the prefix name converter, you create it, pass in that prefix you want, and then um, set up your, your normalizer, and then if you would serialize that, you basically would get everything prefixed with movie underscore. Another thing that we, you might notice here is that in the XML representation, um, we always have this response tag uh, at the root, um, and you might want to change that, and this is where this context thing comes into play. So um, here we are using that third parameter, uh, this context, uh, um, parameter, which is just an array, and we pass in XML root node name movie, and as a result, now uh, we have a movie tag uh, rather than a response tag. 
And of course, if you then, you know, you could, you know, have that context XML root name uh, configured, but then choose to um, uh, serialize to JSON, and then it will just be ignored. Um, now, deserializing into an existing object is also something that you might want. So you might have, like, a... Um, some data that comes from the outside and some data that comes from your database, um, and you want to enrich that uh, object that you got back from the database with some data that's coming from the outside. So basically what you can do is you could, um, you, know, you can have a, a movie instance in this case. So here we see that, that this dollar movie one, in case, this case we're manually instantiating it, but it could come from you know, any other system. Um, and then in the deserialize, we could, uh, in the context, specify object to populate, um, and then instead of um, uh, creating a new instance, it would take that instance and uh, put in whatever it finds in the uh, serialized data uh, and adds that to the given properties. Um, and, you know, whatever it doesn't overwrite will then uh, stay as is. So, um, so here in this example we see an XML where, you know, we have duration and release date. Um, and when we first created that movie instance, we, we didn't set these. Um, but thanks to this uh, uh, object to populate, we would have both the data that we set up during the construction of the uh, movie instance as well as what we had in the XML file. All right. Um, so far, so good. So some even more uh, advanced things. So one of the... The challenging things to deal with serialization is um, you usually, or in many cases, end up having object graphs. So you have you know, one object that has a property uh, in which you store another object, and you know, that graph can get really deep. Um, and um, so for this case, um, there are some things that have been added to the serializer. And these are, um, these are things that, uh, in our initial implementation, we didn't even bother dealing with. Um, so it's really great that this has been added. So let's say we have, in this movie class, we have uh, a property called genre, which stores an instance of a genre class. We have uh, another property called directors, which is actually an array of director class instances. And then we have uh, a role, um, which uh, is also an array of uh, role instances. And that role actually also has references to movies. Um, so we basically have um, a cyclical uh, dependency here. Um, so we'll see how to deal with that. So first up, let's look at just the simple uh, first case with the genre. We have a one-to-one -one unidirectional relationship. Um, so that's not so hard to deal with. Um, so in the example here first, we make an instance of genre. Uh, we make an instance of movie, assign that genre instance, and then we serialize that to XML. Um, you know, just for good measure, we set an, uh, the root name to movie, and voila, this is what we would get in XML. Um, so kind of what we would hope for, right? We have the genre object embedded uh, into the serialization of the movie uh, tag. And then for JSON, uh, again, what we would expect. Um, what's kind of nice here is that you might notice that the, the tag name genre here, um, so here we don't, uh, we only need to set this for the root. We need to set what, um, what name to use. Here it will automatically use the property name. Um, so there, again, just for the root, we need to manually set it. Uh, from then on, um, it will already know what uh, tag name to use. All right, so uh, next up, let's look at the director case. Um, so this is, uh, we're basically dealing with an array um, of uh, um, object instances that are stored in the property, so one to many. So we set up multiple directors um, and uh, assign these um, to the movie class. Again, here you get kind of what you would hope for, kind of. Um, so here you have uh, sort of directors tag. Um, and honestly, uh, what I would wish for here rather is to be, have a director tag, I guess. Um, but, you know, it depends on your taste. Um, but, uh, or you might want something that, you know, you have a director's tag and then you have multiple director tags within. Um, but this is what you get out of the box um, if, you're doing, if you're calling a serializer. And this is what you would get uh, with uh, the JSON. Um, so that's out of the box already more or less what you would want um, with a you know, director's key and then an area underneath. Now, next up, it gets a little bit more tricky. So we have a many-to-many -many relationship um, between the role because our role class looks like this. We basically 
have a movie instance in there as well. Um, and so if we have a movie instance, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, that actually has uh, several roles attached to it, and the roles themselves also have uh, the same movie reference, you basically have a graph. Um, and that becomes a little bit more tricky to deal with because, you know, if you just keep serializing, then, you know, you come back and you basically are stuck in a loop. So out of the box, if you just call serialize now, uh, you would get an exception like this, uh, so a circular reference exception, essentially. Uh, but there's really some nice feature here. Um, you can set a um, circular reference handler um, on your normalizer. Um, what, you end, what you pass in here is actually callable. Um, so in this case, we're just uh, using a closer. Um, and uh, you just return um, an ID instead. So basically, whenever it now encounters it, it, or it determines that this um, is a circular dependency, instead of throwing that exception, it's going to call that closure um, to figure out um, what representation to use instead. So now, if we uh, serialize that roles thing, um, it will detect when it comes to the movie that this is a circular reference. And then instead of going through the normal serialization process to try and serialize that, it's just going to call our closure and get that ID. Um, so obviously, um, this is a little bit uh, simple in the sense that you might have like multiple you know, scenarios for circular graphs, and maybe it's not always the get ID method that you need to use there. So maybe that function needs to be more complex, like you actually need to check, is it an instance of that, then call this method, is it an instance of that, then call that method. But um, yeah, so basically it's now possible to deal with circular dependencies. Now, another thing that you might want to do, and this is actually how Drupal 8 uses uh, the Symfony uh, serializer component extensively, is with custom normalizers. Um, so, um, so one thing that you, know, you might want to do is you might want to use uh, the date time instance rather than just the string for the date uh, in your object. Um, and so if you would serialize that, then, you know, it works. You know, your serialized date will just look like this, which is basically the serialized uh, representation of a daytime object, uh, which is probably, however, not what you really want. Um, so what you could do is um, you could uh, use um, uh, uh, a custom callback uh, in your normalizer to deal with that specific case. So again, we use the standard object normalizer um, and then we, we create a callback, and this again, again, this is a callable. We're using a closure here. And then you just set a callback, and you define for which properties names you want to use the callback. So in this case, we use release date, uh, birth date, and, and, and death date. Um, and then uh, instead of getting this ginormous uh, representation, we get a much more compact representation um, of a date, um, which you know, includes the day, the time, and the time zone, which should be sufficient to get our date time object uh, reinstated uh, when we deserialize. So here's the JSON res representation. Um, yeah, and actually, I, I kind of got confused. So I just told you the callback normalizer. This is not what Drupal 8 is using. This is what Drupal 8 is using, custom normalizers. Um, so basically, um, a custom normalizer, you just need to implement uh, the normalizable interface and um, then uh, either the normalized method, um, if you just want to have a normalizer, or as well the denormalizer if you want to uh, have a denormalizer as well. So let's have a look here. Uh, so this is a custom uh, um, normalizer. Um, or sorry, no, I'm, I'm getting confused again. So we're still not where what Drupal 8 uses. So this is, um, sorry, backtracking. So this is something, um, so with this custom normalizer, what you can do is you can actually attach some logic about how to normalize that given object to that uh, class itself. So here we have the role, and the role implements the normalizable interface. Um, and so with that normalizer interface, instead of going through the normal normalizer when it encounters such a, a, an object instance, it's going to call the normalized method on that class. Um, so, um, so basically, this enables you, especially when you're dealing with larger object graphs, sometimes it might not make sense to have like this ginormous chain of normalizers that you register to deal with all these special cases for all these different classes. Um, so with this normalizer interface, um, 
you can uh, add, attach these, this logic to the classes themselves. Um, so this is, has the advantage that you don't have to register that many normalizers because, as you might remember, otherwise we would have to iterate it over every normalizer to find the right one uh, for the given class. So this is sort of a way to optimize performance if you need to deal with lots of normalizers. What is kind of ugly with it is that you're, you end up sort of polluting your role object with something that I find is uh, not the responsibility of the role uh, class itself to know how to serialize it how to serialize itself or how to normalize itself to an array. Um, so I think it's, it's a sort of a little bit of a, of a performance hack, in my opinion. Um, but it can also be sort of uh, nice in the way that you keep everything in one place. Um, yeah, if you start, end up having lots of normalizers, then this might be um, a better alternative. There's also the serializer aware interface. So this is something if you create a custom normalizer, um, you can um, uh, basically uh, have it implement the serializer, uh, serializer aware interface, which basically means it's automatically going to get the serializer attached to it. Um, and this is uh, this area denormalizer that I talked, to, uh, talked about that is um, coming in uh, Symphony 2.8. Um, basically what that, um, that area denormalizer does is that when you call the, the denormalize method, there was a second a parameter which is called type. Um, and this type, you usually specify a class name. Um, and uh, with this array denormalizer, what you can do is you can deal with arrays of class instances. So instead of just passing in the class name, you actually specify class name and then uh, brackets, uh, opening and closing brackets in uh, the type uh, that you pass in. And as you see here in the supports denormalization method, what it does, it checks is the end of that string uh, uh, opening and closing brackets and do I support uh, denormalization of the type without those opening and closing brackets? Then it says this uh, error denormalizer can denormalize this. And then in the denormalizer method itself, what it does, it actually calls the denormalizer um, and, uh, um, without those uh, curly brackets. So again, the, the point is that you can deal with an array of object instances and hint the type that uh, uh, you want to deserialize into. Another really cool feature that was added to the serializer uh, is serialization groups. And this can be quite useful, for example, if you have different permissions and depending on permissions, you want to show more or less. Um, so let's say here we have the movie class again and we want to show the ID only to admins when we serialize, um, but the title should be also viewable by other uh, roles like publishers and users and so on and so forth. So these annotations, um, also YAML configuration or XML configuration, and in fact, I think you can also configure it via PHP, um, you can uh, configure these serialization groups. Then um, creating um, or setting up your serializer becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, so you need to set up the, the metadata loaders that you want to use. Um, you don't have to use all of them, of course. So if you just use annotations, you don't need the XML file or the YAML file loader. Um, and um, yeah, so you basically uh, configure your annotation uh, loader, um, uh, attach that to your class metadata factory, and then pass that in as the first parameter to the object normalizer. And um, you, know, you just need to do that once, of course, in your code or when you set up your service. Um, and there you go. Uh, you now would have support for this group feature. So uh, if you call the serialize method now, you can add in your context um, you know, the, the group that you want to serialize to, so users, for example, and then it will automatically apply the rules. And in this case, it would skip the ID property and would not serialize that and ex therefore not expose that to the outside. Now, there's of course, still development going on. Um, so one thing that is currently under discussion is um, in the denormalization to use type hinting. Um, so in, in many cases, it actually is possible to sort of figure out um, what uh, class to, uh, to denormalize into um, when you're dealing with an object graph um, because that's kind of like currently not really nicely possible. So let's say we have an invoice class. Um, this invoice class has a property uh, with uh, a customer, um, and you know we have the set customer uh, method, and it, you know it has a type in for the customer class. 
And the idea here is that based on that set, cust set customer method and the type-in that we have here is that the serializer could actually automatically figure out that, in fact, it needs to create an instant of the customer um, when it deserializes. Um, so this is currently being worked on. Um, as far as I know, uh, this will actually result in another uh, component, right, Fabian? Are we doing the... Yeah, so this is going to be a new component. Um, so uh, um, Kevin, he basically ha already created a component for dealing with uh, basically having a single API that can introspect um, and try to find such information, not only from type-ins, but also from, um, from PHP doc comments. Um, it also, also supports uh, PHP 7 um, return type-ins and things like that. Um, and um, I think it also supports even hacklang. I don't know exactly. Um, I haven't looked at the code in detail. But with, once we have that um, uh, component inside Symfony, we can start using that in the serializer um, to very um, more elegantly deal with deserialization of object graphs. All right. So how do you use all of that in Drupal? Um, so as I mentioned, um, the serializer component is actually a core piece of Drupal 8. Um, it's part of you know, the, the REST APIs that uh, Dries was talking about this morning. Um, and so there are basically two modules. So the first one is the serialization module, um, which basically does the, the, the core work of integrating the Symfony serializer into Drupal. And I'm not a, a, a Drupal expert by any means. Um, I think the only time that I install Drupal is kind of through Platform at Sage and spinning up a Drupal instance there. Um, and uh, I tried to update these slides a little bit um, based on uh, like just seeing that the, the state has changed a little bit since the LA talk. I think there's minor things that have changed since then. Essentially, you have the, you know, your core module um, you know, with your, your standard files. Um, the most inter interesting one, and I'm actually going to sh show a little bit about that in the coming slides, is the, the services that are being defined. Um, uh, Drupal 8 ships with lots of custom encoders uh, and normalizers, and um, they in turn use what is called entity resolvers. So this is a, a Drupal-specific concept that's not part of um, Symfony itself. And um, so here you see an overview of the normalizers. Um, so these are uh, several normalizers uh, available out of the box in Drupal 8. Um, and I, as far as I know, out of the box, none of the Symfony uh, normalizers are being used in Drupal 8. Right. And now, if you look at that serialization services.yaml, um, this is not the entire content of the file. Essentially, what you have here is um, <clears throat> you define a serial, there's a serializer service here, a normalizer, and an encoder that's defined here. Um, and what you might notice here is that, you know, these arguments to the serializer, so this, this was this array of normalizers and arrays of encoders. This is empty here. What, what happens here is that Drupal actually uses something that, uh, that's called tags in, uh, that is supported by the dependency injection container. So here you see in that uh, normalizer uh, list service, it has a tag called name uh, normalizer. And based on that, Drupal will actually automatically realize that this is supposed to be a normalizer and add that to the array that is being passed as the first argument uh, up into that serializer service. And the same thing happens with the encoder. Um, so here, a JSON encoder instance is defined, and then with the tag name encoder, it's um, going to be uh, created as an instance and passed into an array um, as a second parameter for the format JSON. So you end up with um, <clears throat> you know, lots of services that are being defined. Um, in most part, the only one that you should be using is the one at the top serializer. Um, so that's the one that should be considered sort of public. Um, the rest, as far as I uh, sort of figure out from the Drupal 8 co code, is actually also public, so you can also get it <coughs> from the dependency injection container. But um, uh, I wouldn't advise to use them um, because they might go away later in Drupal 8 or so on um, because you, re you really shouldn't need to use them because you can get everything that you need um, sort of by just working with the methods available in the serializer. Now, there's a second uh, module in there uh, called the HAL module, which sort of expands on the basic JSON support to support <laughs> HAL. <coughs> um, HAL is basically um, 
a custom format on top of JSON. Actually, it's also available for XML, if I remember correctly, um, which basically enables you to build uh, REST APIs with a little bit more assumptions that you get from the standard JSON representation. And so this module basically just adds a bunch of encoders and normalizers um, and some additional services that are then, through this tagging system, also being attached to the serializer module uh, serializer service. Yeah, so here you just basically get some additional uh, services, and here actually all of these should be considered private. Um, I just screwed up on the slide there. Now, um, that basically concludes what I wanted to talk about for the serializer component. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention uh, the JMS serializer uh, library. Um, and this is actually a library that is actually the main reason why I stopped working on the serializer component itself, because um, Johannes Schmidt, who created that, um, did a really good job in very quickly supporting um, uh, and handling uh, circular graphs uh, very elegantly. And what he did there was also that instead of um, where you in the core serializer, what we have is basically you have these normalizers that are just um, expected to be quite generic in how they deal with things. Um, or if you make them more specific, you end up with this gigantic array. Um, what he did there was basically you have a lot of mapping files with, where you specify how things should be normalized. Um, so it's a very different way of dealing with normalization. I thought, at least initially, it's more elegant. Uh, it turns out that his approach is indeed very elegant. Um, it's also very flexible, um, and it's very powerful, but it comes at a big overhead. So basically, especially for simpler ca cases, um, you're going to have slower performance than what you could achieve easily with the serializer with less uh, work uh, and configuration and so on and so forth. So um, I would say generally use the JMS serializer if you have very elaborate, very deep object graphs and very much and in many situations where you need to customize uh, things. Um, and I would, for simpler cases, uh, um, use the uh, Symfony serializer. There's one other thing to consider, um, which is important from a legal perspective. Um, the JMS serializer uses the Apache license, uh, which is incompatible with the GPL license. So of course, if you're creating your own code, you can combine as you wish. But if you ship that code, um, then you're sort of in a legal gray area. Um, because so if you distribute code that is mixed between GPL and Apache license, then considering the fact that the both are incompatible, you're actually violating uh, the licenses, uh, at least of the GPL. Um, so that's something to consider, and that's also one of the reasons why the JMS serializer was never considered for core. Um, all right, so I'm already through with my slides, um, and uh, I assume there are probably some questions that I could answer. Um, there's a microphone over there. If you have questions, that would be best. But if not, I can just repeat it so we get it on the recording. There's no movement. Everything was clear. Um, no questions. Any comments or additions from some of the Drupal experts that can maybe say something relevant about Drupal uh, that I cannot add? I guess then we're done a little bit early. I can, I'll try to name drop something here. Um, so later on today, I'm doing a talk together with a coworker of mine. Um, the talk is name is Teal is the New Orange. I'm not sure if everybody gets the reference to the TV show. Um, but uh, the, the topic, this is actually sort of a, a soft uh, uh, topic. Um, we're talking about self-managing organizations. Um, we talk a lot about basically how the company I work for, Leap, uh, is organized and how it's evolving and what we have planned for the future, so it's non-technical. Um, but to me, this talk is really exciting. Um, I feel a lot of pressure because I feel very passionate about what we're talking there. Um, and um, so I hope I don't screw it up, but uh, I would appreciate to have lots of people there because I think it's something um, that any organization can benefit from, from, benefit from uh, or at least to have sort of in the back of your head um, you know, thinking of our organizations that are much more engaging, much more rewarding to people, and then I think fundamentally also more productive. So anyway, thank you very much for listening, and have a great conference.